Eric von Danigan has been a lifelong student of ancient texts that reveal the presence of beings from other worlds who helped to establish the origins of human civilization. As he unfolds the details of his life, we discover the impetus which set him upon this path, and we gain deeper insights into his philosophy of the gods and why the extraterrestrials came here. He explains that our modern society is slowly becoming ready to accept that there are other forms of life in the universe far in advance of our own civilization. Please join us for this fascinating one-on-one -on -one interview in this episode of Gaia's series, Great Minds. My name is Eric van Deniken. I am Swiss. I am the author of Chariots of the Gods and 40 other books. All these books have the same subject. Were extraterrestrials here thousands of years ago? I was educated in Switzerland as a strict Catholic in a boarding school led by Jesuits. Of course, I was a deep believer in God. I still am a believer in God, all through. I do not know what God really is. But when I was a boy, 17 years old, God for me had to have some qualities. For example, God makes no mistake. God does not need a vehicle in which to move around from point A to point B. God is all over. Now, in this boarding school, we had to translate parts of the Bible from Latin to Greek and from Greek to German. And then I learned that in the Bible, the God, which is described there, he uses a vehicle to move around. He descends on the holy mountain with smoke and fire and trampling and loud noise and so on. And he made some mistakes. So of a sudden, I had doubts in my own Catholic education. And I simply wanted to find out if other communities in antiquity have similar traditions, then we have it from the Christian and the Jewish tradition. That was the beginning of Chariots of the Gods. Long time ago, over 50 years. In the meantime, I'm an 84 year old man. Of course, I am married since 58 years with the same wife. I have two grandchildren and I'm happy to be alive and to work as I do it. Well, as every child, I was not different, except I was always a musician. I was always trying to play some instruments. Now as a boy, as a small boy, the drums, and later growing up in school, the trumpet, and of course the piano. Of course, even as a boy, I was a member of a band, a jazz band at that time. If I would not have become a best-selling author, my career would have gone in a direction of music. From my family, we came from the hotel business. My grandmother had a hotel with a restaurant, so I was growing up in the hotel and restaurant business. And of course, I made first my high school in a, the sporting school in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. So, six years in that boarding school. You know, in the boarding school, we had, for example, translated part of the Bible. It's the second book in Moses. Before the Lord descends on the holy mountain, he gives order to Moses that Moses should create a gate around the holy mountain. Otherwise, the Israelites would be destroyed. So Moses constructs a gate. And then the Lord descends with smoke and fire and trampling and loud noise. So I said to myself, my God, the real almighty God of all religion, that the spirit of the universe does not need to construct first a gate for safety, does not come down with smoke and fire and loud noise. So I had my doubts in that boarding school. And of course, I was talking to this to my professors. 
And they were not afraid. They said, Eric, if you think in this direction, you should learn much more about the old scriptures before you discuss this. And they told me, Eric, go to Father, whatever the name was, and ask for a book of Enoch. I asked for a book of Enoch. I read the book of Enoch. I was completely confused. You know, Enoch in the Bible, you simply hear that he was the first human who disappeared in a fiery chariot from this planet. And uh, they say he was the seventh patriarch before the great flood. Now, well, roughly 180 years ago, a British uh, uh, explorer came to Ethiopia. And in uh, Ethiopia, he came into an old library. And in this old library, he found a book with the title, The Book of Enoch. Slowly, he translated the book of Enoch from the Ethiopian language into English, later from English into German. And now as a boy, I had the German translation before my eyes. And I was completely shocked because Enoch speaks in the first person, an eyewitness, not in the third person. He says he was 12 years old. The whole community of the village wanted to go to sleep. Then they hear the noise in the sky. They saw a light in the sky. Of a sudden, the light fell down to the earth, and all the inhabitants of the village ran away. They were afraid, except Enoch. He says, I stood there in astonishment. Then of a sudden, two beings came close to me in glittering uh, uh, clothes. And he says clearly, these two beings did not look like humans. They did not breathe like humans. They breathe differently. I never saw beings like this on earth. He's afraid, Enoch, finally, he falls on his ground too. Then somebody picks him up and says to him, son of humans, don't be afraid. We won't hurt you. And then follows the whole story, an incredible story in the book of Enoch. So I was completely fascinated of Enoch. And later, of course, I learned that we find similar stories in the Maya texts. The same thing happened in the old Indian text. Always one person is taken out. Also, they learn the language of the strangers. Enoch receives a writing device. Then they dictate them books, books about science, astronomy, calendar, engineering, and all this. Now, the critics come and say, come on, this is ridiculous. How should extraterrestrials speak Enoch's language? In our time, our ethnologists, they were visiting some tribe for on the upper Amazon River or maybe on the upper Nile River. It was never a problem of learning the language of the natives within a short period. After five, six months, our ethnologists understood the languages of the tribe. These extraterrestrials, they behaved themselves like ethnologists would do. They studied their group before visiting them. So I'm not shocked at all if the stranger speaks to Enoch in Enoch's language. And the stranger says to Enoch, don't be afraid. And he says, if you wish, you can come with us. We teach you. Enoch says, yes, I wish to be, to be teached. He receives an overall, something like the same spacesuit which they had on. Then they go up. He describes over the earth. I saw the round earth and I saw gigantic things. He compares them with brilliance, with diamonds and so on. Doors open, doors close. They go in there. He passes through strange gardens with, with vegetables and flowers, which he had never seen on earth. Then he comes into a big room and there in the center of the room, there was a throne. And on this throne, the highest was sitting. When the tree came in there, two of the extraterrestrials and Enoch, the highest stands up, works a few steps to what Enoch shakes his hand and says him, welcome here at our place. Now, what I just told you is part of the book of Enoch, but not the way I told it to you. Because some 160 years ago, when Enoch was translated first from the Ethiopian language into English, all these brilliant professors at that time, they knew nothing about space travel, nothing about spaceships, nothing about flying. So they believed we have to see all these things in a religious context. So the translation is different to what I say.
I am a deep believer in God. And all these things, what is handed down, is not belonging to God. God is omnipotent. Imagine for a second that my idea would be correct. So we were visited by beings from outer space. The next question is, where did these visitors come from? What is their evolution? Have they been influenced by another solar system? Okay, where did the other come from? And so on. You can play back the game for thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. Finally, you arrive to a starting point where in every respect with religion, you have to confess and to say, here is God. Here is the beginning. Here is the spirit. So you never lose God. I never lost my God. I am one of these figures who still pray every evening. But my prayer really changed completely. Educated as a Christian, of course, I was praying to the Holy Mother Mary or to Jesus and the cross. In the meantime, I pray to what I call God. All true, I have no definition of God. I read quite some intelligent uh, books about what is God. No, none of these scientists was able to make a definition of God. But our little spirit, our little understanding says there is a beginning of the universe. There must be creation. And this is what we call God. I call it today the spirit of the universe. First, I read as many books as possible concerning the beginning of the religions. So how did the Sumerian religion begin? How did the Egyptian religion begin? How did the Maya religion begin and all this? And then being critical and saying, what's going on here? Give you an example. Every culture has its calendar. And every calendar has a starting point. We Christian, we have a Christian calendar. And the starting point was the birth of Jesus Christ. So the starting point is always very, very important for a certain culture because you just don't start the calendar for nothing. The same thing happened in Central America. There's a calendar of the Maya. And the Maya calendar starts on August 11th, 3114 BC. So asking myself, what was the reason? Why have they started their Maya calendar on August 11, 3114 BC? What was so important? When the Spanish conqueror arrived in Central America, they found thousands and thousands of books written by the Maya. They destroyed them all, except three books which have left. Well, now just imagine in our society, if for a war or whatever, every Bible would be destroyed. But the priests and the believers in Christianity, they know the context of the Bible in their brain. So they start to rewrite the Bible. The same thing happened in Central America. All through the books were destroyed. The priests rewrote their old knowledge. And so the Chilam Balam book happened. And in the Chilam Balam book, one of the priests explains why have our forefathers started the calendar of the Maya on August 11, 3014 BC? Because that was the day when the gods descended from the firmament. That was the starting point. So the next step was archaeology. First you look in archaeological textbooks, you see what discovery were made, and then you go there. I was in every archaeological place what I have written about, and not just like a tourist. I was sometimes there for months or weeks. Now in Central America, they found a secret groove, a tomb with a, a stone plate, quite a block, uh, weighting 10 tons. And on this stone block, an engraving, incredible engraving. You see something like a frame. And in the center of the frame, a young man is sitting, bending forward, almost like a motorizing cyclist. You clearly see he has an oxygen mask on his nose. He uses his two hands to manipulate some control. You see the upper hand, the, his fingers, the lower hand with the four fingers in the back. He's winding up something. He's sitting on a chair and outside the frame, you see a linking flame. 
I was completely fascinated because the stone was chiseled unknown thousands of years ago. So I was there for at least 12 days talking with archaeologists and finally bring it into my books. So this is one of the optical uh, proofs to say we were influenced by God. The difference between uh, my point of view and the point of view of an archaeologist is the archaeologist does not take mythology for serious. They think mythology is all nonsense. And I take these mythologies and these religious books for honest. I say these writers some thousands of years ago, they did not tell us science fiction story. You know, when the first men started to learn writing, cuneiform learning, so only a few people were able to write. They did not write science fiction. The high priest would come or the king, what are you doing here? That's not true. You know, many mythologies are just fairy tales, but not all of them. And mythologies, you can never take precise. It's not a, a scientific story, but it's, it's the knowledge of, the common knowledge of the people, what they knew. There is always a core of truth in mythology, and you can easily separate which one is the truth and which one is just a, an allegory. Let me explain you this. Enoch, again, he's in the spaceship, he learned the language. Now one of the teachers says to Enoch, human, look out of the window. Do you see this little light out there? You humans, you call it the moon, but the moon has no light by itself. The moon receives his light from the sun. And then the extraterrestrials explains to Enoch, why is the moon sometimes full in light, bright shining, only half, why it disappears. So this is astronomical knowledge. This is not fiction. And then he explains Enoch our calendar, that around our planet, around our sun, different planets are turning. The third planet is our planet Earth. And he explained, your planet surrounds your sun in 365 days plus leak hours, not leak days, leak hours. So this is scientific knowledge. So all this is not fantasy. In every human, we have a living beast in our brain. And this beast is called curiosity. Whatever is intelligent has curiosity and curiosity is never ending. You always have new questions. Soon as you think you have an answer, the next question comes up. So because of my knowledge of the old writings, my brain is able to connect these things. When I wrote Chariots of the Guards, I was the managing director of a five-star hotel in Switzerland, in Davos. And of course, since my student time, I always studied the old religions and mythology. I knew a lot about it. As a hotel manager, I discussed with my guests. In the evening, we were sitting together on a bar and table with a glass of wine. And one of my guests, he was the chief editor of a big German weekly newspaper, Die Zeit. So he was the chief editor and said, Eric, you should write a book. I said, listen, I have a book, I have a manuscript, but I cannot find a publisher. The next morning, I just hear him on the phone saying to a strange person, listen, Irvin, I'm sitting here in Switzerland, there is a young hotel manager, and he has just written an incredible book. You should talk to him. So I received the publisher, which I don't know, on the phone, and he asked me, can you come to Düsseldorf in Germany within the next week? So I went to Düsseldorf, I presented the manuscript. He read only 10 pages of the manuscript. I was sitting like a boy in a chair. And after 10 uh, uh, pages in the manuscript, he said, young man, if you are right, okay, we published the book. And then it all started. Of course, I was crashed down practically by everyone especially the scientific community, especially the archaeologists and the theologians who said, come on, you cannot look at this. I mean, 
Van Deniken is writing about the prophet Ezekiel in the Bible, and he says that Ezekiel uh, was in a spaceship, but we theologians, we know he had a vision. Even, you know, the astronomers can, the astrophysics said, okay, it might be that some extraterrestrial life exists somewhere out there, but we have no proof for it. Even if it would exist, extraterrestrial life, these beings would never look like us because evolution on another planet goes completely different. So if extraterrestrials exist, they would maybe look like, I don't know, big beings with tentacles and whatever. And even if they do exist, extraterrestrials and terrestrials will never meet together. So all these critical points, they were reasonable at that time. Seen from their standing point, it was okay. In the meantime, it has completely changed. I'm an 84-year-old uh, man, so and I live in a wonderful family. We all respect each other. None of my family says he's an idiot, he's a fool. They all help me with my fight. I remember my daughter, daughter Cornelia. Once I had a speech. I, I always have a somebody who helps in the speech because somebody has to to uh, do the slide projector and all these things. And somebody was sick. I asked my 14-year-old daughter, please help me this evening. All what you have to do is to, to, to manipulate this uh, slide projector. She did it, she came to my speech, and after my speech, she gave me a hunk. She said, Daddy, this is incredible. Finally, I understand it. So, I'm quite happy. Why do I am so enthusiastic? Why do I continue with all this thing? Why? Because the gods, the so-called gods, will return. And we, humanity, we should be prepared for this event. We should not be afraid of them. We should not be shocked when they, they return. And we should learn that we all, if we are black people, white people, yellow people, if we are Catholics or Muslim or whatever, we all are the intelligent human race on this little blue planet. So we all make together humanity. Stop with all this rubbish of racism, all of this rubbish of only my religion is the only one. Soon as we get in contact with extraterrestrials, we have to speak with them as humanity. According to my information, we are already, in our days, under observation. I know the biggest part of these UFO cases are nonsense, are just uh, irritations or imaginations or non-scientific. But some of the cases are very, very serious. We should listen to these people. We should listen to them what happened. So we are under observation. By the way, I myself never saw a UFO. I'm unhappy, I would like lucky to see a UFO. So, these extraterrestrials, if they are here, they have a much more advanced technology than we. It would be no problem for them to show up in a football stadium. The whole humanity would see, hey, what's happening here? There's a UFO, over 10,000 of people standing, fl flying over the stadium. They could do it. Why do they not do it? because they know how we function, how we react. If we are not prepared for this event, we will be completely shocked. So we have to be prepared. We have to lose our fear. We have to understand they are not here to, to kill us, to destroy us. They could have done this for eternity. They are here to help us. To help us in what? To help us in technology. Today, we have a lot of problems on our planet, you know, with pollution, overpopulation, world warming, climate, and all these things. The extraterrestrials will not solve our problem. They had their own evolution, and they had all these problems at their home too, maybe some 10,000 years ago. They tell us what we must do to solve these problems, but we have to do it ourselves.
as every educated person I know, we are in the middle of a climate change. That's for sure, no one can deny this. But now whole humanity is fighting against the climate change by avoiding CO2. But the problem is in antiquity, I mean, seven, 8,000 years ago, we had already climate change. This can be proven absolutely clear because the glaciers went back and the stones. But some 8,000 years, there were no humanity with industries, with cars who produced CO2. So maybe we are on the wrong track fighting against CO2, hoping that this would change our climate. So we can ask the extraterrestrials, we have a problem, climate change. What can we do against to help it? Maybe they teach us it's not CO2, it's something different. You have to fight against it. Forty years from now, I was invited by NASA. It was a secret speech. We both parties agreed that none would go to public. All the high professors in rocketry were there. In that speech, I shortly also speak about the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Later, we were all sitting together at dinner, and then the chief of the construction of NASA at that time, Mr. Joseph Blomberg, came to me on the table and said, Eric, you are the first person who brings me to this prophet Ezekiel. I never, I never read of this. I will do this in the next weeks. He did it. He read Ezekiel and he became astonished. And started to Ezekiel to take Ezekiel seriously. Then two other NASA scientists came to him, to Blumrich and said, what are you doing with the Bible on your desk? He said, look, there's a prophet calling Ezekiel. He describes the vehicle which came down. We can reconstruct, recalculate what this vehicle must have looked like. Slowly, piece by piece, they took every phrase of Ezekiel seriously, not just a few examples, and they reconstructed the spaceship of Ezekiel. Mr. Joe Blumrich, chief of the NASA constructing department, came out with the book. The English title was The Spaceship of Ezekiel. In the foreword, he confesses he started his work against Eric von Däniken. He wanted to disprove this idea of Ezekiel, but he found out the contrary was uh, true, and he was very happy with this. Still today, uh, there are a lot of skeptics who think whatever Eric von Däniken writes is garbage, is nonsense. And I love the discussions with skeptics because they lose anyhow in a long discussion. And whenever I come together with skeptics who think I'm an idiot, I ask them, which book, which of my titles have you read? They say, none. They read nothing. They simply knew in advance, it's all, it's all nonsense. Of course, I learned from the skeptics too. In many cases, the critics were correct. And I had to say, oh, come on, this point of view makes more sense than my point of view, which is normal in a discussion. But roughly, the extraterrestrials were here some thousands of years ago. Our ancestors at that time could not understand what it was. They called it the gods. Roughly, this story I can prove by indication. There are no gods in reality. So it's all a misunderstanding. But they believed these are the gods. That's why the so-called gods entered into the big religions, into mythologies, legends, etc. It's all a misunderstanding. Well, my life has changed because I'm an enthusiastic man and I'm a man full of curiosity. I always have new questions. I still have no idea where did these extraterrestrials come from? Which solar system? How far away? With what technology? What was finally the purpose? Why have they chosen to come to our planet, to our solar system? There are still hundreds of open questions which I tried to come closer and closer. I found 
brilliant indications to support that extraterrestrials were here, but I never found a conclusive proof. Until today, I am missing an object, an object which is not from this planet, which I could present proudly to the scientific community say, hey, this object is not from our planet, so help me out. What is the, the, the situation? So, but I know such objects do exist because they were here. And we have descriptions, for example, in the Bible, we have description of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was not a, a, a human object. It was an extraterrestrial object. So we know that some of these objects exist, but we have never found them. In many other fields, I know nothing. I am just a student, happy to learn from the others. But in my field, I know quite a lot, so I can debate, and that makes me happy. New paradigm, new way of thinking, a new way of curiosity, a new way of question marks. That's what I'm bringing forward, and I hope the society continues. In the meantime, I hope some of us have learned we are not alone. There are other societies out there. We have learned to become a little more humble. We have learned that space travel is possible even from star to star. We have learned that it is possible to change the cell, the DNA in the cell. So it is possible to create something. I am sure we are the product of evolution. We cannot deny evolution, but there was always in the past thousands of years, somebody who did something in our evolution. Extraterrestrials from time to time made a little changing in our evolution. So in the future, our genetics are brilliant personalities. They will find out this in the genes. Soon as we know this, we all are part of evolution, but not only. We are a little part of extraterrestrials too. That's why we understand them. That's why we will understand each other very well. So my latest book in English language is a sequel of Chariots of the Gods. I continue with Chariots of the Gods. I say, what happened in the past 50 years? What happened and where do we stand now? And it comes close to it. We are under observation. We have some UFO cases which we should take for serious. That's the, the content of my new book. Be prepared. We are under observation. And sooner or later, they will show up again. The title is The Gods Never Left Us. The Archive hopes you enjoyed this insightful look at the man who many researchers consider the grandfather of the ancient astronaut theory. We encourage you to take a look at the rest of the Great Minds series on Gaia, which takes you one-on-one -on -one with some of the most informative people in this field of study. The Archive has provided several links in the description for you to gain limited free access to the awesome knowledge base offered by Gaia. Take advantage of the free 7-day trial and explore all that Gaia has to offer.